That was a wonderful presentation, David. Thank you so much. You can see, those of you who don't know Dr. Diodoma that well, how incredibly Renaissance man he is and how incredibly deserving he is of the Integrative Healthcare Symposium Leadership Award for 2023. So it's our, our great honor to present this to Peter. Please come up. Thank you, sir. Kind of hard to respond to that. Uh, just an honor to be here. And, you know, I don't know necessarily if I deserve all those wonderful praises. Uh, I've just looked at my career as a, an exercise in fun and self-improvement. Uh, but also, too, it was this belief that there was something deep down inside that uh, could be part of a, a new reality that, that um, you know, as we open up to new things and we grow, uh, the world opens up to us. And, uh, you know, when you look at things like expression, that expression that comes through the process of discovery and growth is the universe trying to find something out about itself through us. So ultimately, it's about an, a, kind of a, a kind of a universal uh, educational thing. I do have to thank the people that made this impossible. Of course, my, the girlfriend, Martha, and my lovely daughters. My good friend, fellow co-conspirator, David. Some of my mentors, like uh, David mentioned, <clears throat> one of whom will be here, Joseph Pizzorno, who, who taught me a little bit about how to make nature cure scientific. And John Bastier, who told me to uh, learn your entire life. Uh, James Diadamo, who told me that you could be creative at essentially anything you, you want to put that process towards. So thank you for that. And now let's get started. Let's do this lecture. How do I... How do I make the slides go ahead? Oh. oh, that's it. Okay. So does the big button make it go forward, right? See, this is my technical understanding of things. I still haven't figured out how to turn my, wash, my dishwasher on. Um, so, to whisper sweet nothings was a kind of a Shakespearean quote. Uh, trouble is, the, both of these slides are the same thing. Can I have a way I can see the next slide ahead or no? I'll entertain you with some <laughs> soft shoe here. Um, yeah, it turns out that actually the work I did with blood groups came from my dad. Uh, let's just see if we can do this here. And I, I want to just go through a bit of the, you know, you have to start these lectures now. When you, you give a lecture to a place like IHS, they want to know what your intent is. And so you have to give them one of these outlines. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll go through some of this, this aspects of, of glycomics that are important in, in, in terms of physiology and pathology. Lectins have come into public consciousness a lot more in the last couple of years, and we'll kind of take a, a tour down that particular uh, aspect. And then something called the non-transfusion significance of ABO blood group and a discussion of the FUT2 secretor status because the two of those go together. And it's important to understand how they interact because that's the major phenotypic manifestation of how these things play into uh, disease processes and things like that. Uh, David had a different shot of my graduation class, but this is the only other existing picture of my graduation class. It was the first class at Bastyr. They forgot to get a photographer for our graduation. Nobody actually got a photographer. So this is from a few members. They used to have a thing called the Instamatic. 
that's a in Kodak Instamatic picture that somebody found 20 years later and sent to all of us. I'm the handsome fellow all the way on the uh, left, the third person up, uh, which was generally my place at school was to just be in a position where I didn't attract too much attention. Everybody was from the Northwest. I was from New York City. It was like two different cultures. Uh, I'm still not seeing anything ahead in terms of the slides. Okay, we're getting there. Um, you'll see some lectures on something called the glycocalyx. I noticed that's part of the agenda here. Uh, and that's the glycocalyx when somebody kind of takes a sort of a landscape shot of it. And you can see the actual cell surface uh, and the interior of the cell in the bottom part of the photograph. And then what's extruding out are these uh, glycans, uh, branching carbohydrates that typically are part of either glycoconjugates known as glycolipids or glycoproteins. And these extrude out because of something called a zeta force, which is a negative energy that's produced by one of the key glycans called sialic acid. And so when you go to the science center and rub the ball, and if you have hair, it stands up, uh, that's zeta potential type energy as well. So a lot of the extrusion of these things that com comprise the glycocalyx are positively charged. And this is essentially, if you're a cell and you're trying to reach out to sample the environment, you're doing it by the mosaic of these combinations of glycans that are acting as potential areas of receptors. And this is a very important concept when it comes to certain things that's got to have the cell senses the environment. For instance, if you look at tripwires like uh, uh, you know, EG, uh, VEGF or any of the other membrane factors that are, are responding to environmental changes. They're largely the result of interactions between other players in the exterior environment that are interacting with this complex mixture of glycans. And of course, if you look at things like microbial antigens, uh, tumor antigens, self antigens, HLAs, these are all part of an elaborate series of glycoconjugates. And much of the degenerative processes that are part of how we attempt to understand how people unravel when they get sick are the result of changes in the glycomic structure that we know what we call aberrant glycosylation. So if you want an index of how something unravels on a cellular level, its phenotypic manifestation is going to be essentially on the exterior some manifestation of an aberrant glycosylation process. And again, as David had with that interesting graphic, glycosylation is massively more information gathering than proteomics or lipidomics. So for instance, if you look at a, a protein as the result of an amino acid, amino acid gets strung based upon its transcriptomic pattern. The binding characteristics of the amino acid in turn determine the three-dimensional shape of the protein. So if you've got sulfhydryl amino acids, they cause folding. That folding is like an origami type thing. So it's built in to the structure of the amino acid. Once we string them in a line, that next step, the tertiary assumption of the third stage is automatically a result of the binding characteristics and structure of the amino acids. The next step, which you could call the fourth dimensional imprinting, is the result of glycosylation. That is the imprinting on the protein of all the informatic elements that are necessary to guide that protein through the biological processes, to geolocate that protein. There was an amazing study that they showed. You can take thymocytes and whack off a fucose in a certain place and the thymocyte goes to the liver. You put the fucose back on, the thymocyte goes to the thymus. So a lot of glycosylation information potential has a lot to do with developmental hierarchies, epigenetic programming. Most of your phenotypic manifestations are the result of glycomics. And so consequently, when we get sick, most of the sickness, the pathology that accomplishes, that accompanies uh, the process of sickness are changes in glycosylation. Which slide are you seeing? Okay. I'm, I'm thinking we're one ahead here, so. <laughs> Again, this is really just a nice way of saying what I said 
in a much less nice way. Uh, information we'll talk about again uh, because ultimately everything that we talk about as a result of this lecture is really dealing with trying to understand uh, causal type relationships that result as a genomic consequence and its phenotypic manifestation. I'll get to that later on. Here are the things that are known to influence glycosylation. Animal species. Interesting that glycans attract proteins, right? So what do we know about certain proteins that bind to glycans? Uh, they're known sometimes as either lectins or agglutinins. So you can think of a lectin as a sort of environmental protein with a sweet tooth. So when you have an agglutinin in a bean or in a seed or some embryonic tissue, and it has a propensity for a specific type of glycan, a fucose or mannose or galactose or N-acetylgalactosamine, these are proteins that are seeking, because of their third three-dimensional structure, to bind specifically with these particular types of glycans. This is important for one reason, and it has to do with how we think about how soy influences thyroid function. You might hear soy's been shown to block thyroid function because soy has an agglutinin in it, a lectin, and that lectin targets thyroid tissue. The thing they sort of forgot to say was that it targets thyroid tissue in rodents, but human thyroid tissue glycosylates differently. So in essence, basically, you probably don't get a big antithyroid effect from soybean agglutinin, and that's number one here, that glycosylation varies based on the species of animal. Let's understand something else. If we go back to my favorite thing, blood groups. You know the only species that has four ABO blood types? Humans. There's no other animal that has both O, A, A, B, and B. Animals have O, some have A, some have A and O, some have B. Nobody has A, B, O, and A, B, except for us. What? Advance the slide. She's, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. So this is the one that you're watching. Okay, I, I think I got it. All right. I got a college degree here. I'll figure this out. Um, <laughs> what's the second thing? Blood group specificity. Do you guys get like my lecture on your computer or something? Do you have these slides? Okay, good. At least one of us knows what they're doing. Okay, blood group specificity, single biggest influ influence on glycosylation patterns, as you will see. Well, what's the most basic evidence that blood group influences glycosylation? Well, we possess antibodies to opposing blood groups. You know what happens when you put the wrong antibody in some, you give somebody the wrong blood type in a transfusion? They get sick and die. Okay, why? Well, because that particular opposing antibody is so powerful that it triggers shock and massive hemolysis. Okay, anti-blood group antibodies are IgM antibodies. Okay, the antibodies that you make to the chicken pox you had when you were six years old those are IgG antibodies. IgG antibodies tag. IgM antibodies kill. They need no help from anybody. They just kill. And they do that by agglutinating. People glycosylate differently as they age. That's why a lot of times certain things occur with the tissues. They become less sensitive to hormones because the receptors that are hormone receptor type things get glycosylated and they become less avid for the markers, the hormones, and the stimulants that are supposed to be part of that process. So aging can be thought of as a loss of receptor sensitivity that's the result of changes structurally that are being produced in the cell as a result of glycosylation changes. You glycosylate differently depending upon where in your intestines, your intestines you have. So for instance, in the small intestine, you'll have a different pattern of glycosylation than you will in the colon. The upper colon will glycosylate differently than the lower colon which is why, as we'll get into some other things, you wind up with malignancies in certain places and not in others. A position on the crib villus axis, again, if you remember your physiology, glycosylation changes where the fingers and microfingers of the absorptive capabilities are. And it turns out that that's one of the reasons hemolysins and lectins cause destruction, because they actually target the microvilli and kind of blow it out. 
So when you talk about things like a hyperpermeable intestinal tract or an increase in something called endocytosis, those are always going to be mediated by proteins that are interacting with glycans, and a large number of them are dietary and can be predicted by virtue of knowing the genetics of the ABO expression or the secretor expression in that person. So it's a simple system. Sometimes I think that was the problem when people heard about it. They said, this is too simple. Things can't be that simple. But they can be that simple. And it goes back to a long time when the only way we had genetic information on people was by things like blood types. We didn't have 23andMe back then. Right? So we had one of the simplest ways you can make a, de you know, a genetic determination was blood type. If you change your diet, your, di your digestive tract changes its glycosylation. If you're sick, your body changes its glycosylation. Bacterial overgrowth changes glycosylation. So I'm not going to just belabor the point. But here's a perfect example of a case where glycosylation is linked into a chronic disease. And that chronic disease is actually something that a minor dietary adjustment in the early stages can have a profound effect. Are you familiar with a thing called galactose deficient antibodies? It's sometimes known to be associated with certain types of structural abnormalities. You see it in rheumatoid arthritis. That normally the FC portion of the antibody is made out of polymerized galactose. Now, the FC portion of the antibody is the binding portion. It's the constant portion. The FAB portion is the part that's like the wrench that adjusts itself depending on the size of the nut. The FC portion is the handle. It never changes, right? The FC portion is normally a polymerization of a sugar known as galactose. But in certain instances, like rheumatoid arthritis and certain level autoimmune diseases, these people genetically, as the disease progresses, make an antibody that's associated with a lack of galactose, and what becomes instead replacing galactose is the sugar NAG, and acetyl glucosamine. What's the major problem there? Let's see. I don't know how this is going here. Right, me here. So I hit the button again, nothing's happening. Okay. Excellent. When you have a galactose deficient antibody that's being produced as a result of a genetic autoimmune process, and the galactose in the FC portion of the antibody has been replaced by N acetyl glucosamine the major lectin that reacts with N-acetylglucosamine is wheat germagglutinin, the single biggest lectin in the American diet. Okay? So one of the things that you can actually look at as an early intervention in the early stages of rheumatoid arthritis is to simply take the person off of wheat. And at the end of that point in time, you can basically have a, a, a sort of... Um, an, a, a very deep effect as long as the disease hasn't progressed that far. Once the disease actually sets in, this thing is not that effective. But in the early stages of rheumatoid arthritis, just putting a person, this is the work of a guy named D.J. Freed, English immunologist. I didn't make this up. And again, this is uh, the slide here that you guys are seeing. I should have probably showed you that slide before. Here's our friend, wheat germagglutinin. We, you know, of course, we spend a lot of time thinking about gluten and gliadin, but about 13% of the dry weight of wheat is composed of wheat germagglutinin. Very small molecule, uh, very reactive molecule, uh, and uh, easily endocytosed. Now, that just means that it's easily absorbed. In other words, the mechanisms of endocytosin are such that they actually draw a substance across the gut lining actively. It's known, for instance, that lectins induce endocytosis because there are a variety of patents out on developing pharmaceuticals that are conjugated with lectins so as to increase their absorption. For instance, tomato has a lectin that when you conjugate a drug to it, increases absorption through the buccal membrane. But wheat germagglutinin is one where it's small, easily endocytosed, and sets up a variety of 
uh, consequential issues that are, um, you know, pro-inflammatory. Uh, you have a uh, release of cytokines, interleukin-6, interleukin-10, interleukin-13, uh, interleukin-4. Matter of fact, almost all dietary lectins induce interleukin-4, interleukin-13, which are the major interleukins associated with allergic reactions. I don't remember this slide having these bills. I don't know how I did this, so just bear with me here. If he, you know, this all should have been one slide. This is back when I thought this kind of stuff was impressive. <laughs> now I just want to blather the darn thing on the screen because that's going to be hard enough. Um, perhaps you're familiar with galactins. They've been in a lot of the medical literature. They're lectins that are made in the liver that are galactose-based lectins that are responsible for inflammation, uh, a lot of the uh, effects with regards to uh, uh, adjutant effects in terms of acting as uh, uh, adjuvants and complement inducers. Uh, most of the lectins that you see are in uh, the, uh, f well, the dietary, the legume and grain lectins. Now, it's interesting, and I just want to take a, a moment and kind of explain why I think there's a lectin in the world. You're a bean, okay? Let's make you a, a, a peanut. So there you are under the ground, and there's a fungus that's trying to attach itself to you. So you think to yourself, that's why God gave me an immune system. But you're a peanut, and you don't have an immune system. Okay? So what do you do? Well, you don't have a, an immune system, but thanks to Charles Darwin, you have a built-in set of antibody-like molecules that prevent your body from being taken over by things like bacteria and fungus until you get the chance to germinate. So when you look at dietary lectins that could be problematic... Why are they so commonly embedded in very e common foodstuffs, seeds and beans? Well, these are all little embryos that are trying to, to grow. And the fact that nature needed to give them some way of protecting themselves until they could begin the process of germinating, which leads to two basic pieces of insight. Number one, a lot of things we eat contain lectins. Number two, a lot of times when you sprout a lot of these things, the lectin content disappears because it's no longer needed because it germinated. So when we look at other things as far as classes, the other one I'm kind of interested in, you see that snail down there on the bottom? Snails have a very interesting lectin. It has to do with uh, breast cancer. Well, maybe we'll get a little time, we'll talk about that. Uh, these are some things we could learn about lectins. They're specific oftentimes for human blood groups. So for instance, a food that contains a lectin that might react with a person who has blood type A might not necessarily interact with the erythrocytes or neutrophils or endothelial cells of a person who's blood type O, mainly because there's differences in the sugar content between the two blood types, and lectins are specific for a specific sugar. The word lectin was coined by one of its discoverers because it comes from the Latin leger, which means lock, lock and key. So the word lectin means essentially a very specific, or it actually comes from the Latin I choose. These are choosy, choosy molecules. And I don't have time to go into the specifics, but to give you an idea of the specificity that is implied, you might have some, call you back to med school here, but Glycans, even simple sugars, have a variety of different shapes. So that, for instance, if you have a carbon core and then you have a variety of different outcroppings that are on the glycan, they will go off in different orientations. A 1,6 and a 1,3 will look all in three-dimensional space differently. And that is such that these particular food lectins are so specific that they will react not only to the glycan itself, but the particular conformation of that glycan in space. If, does that glycan have a 1,6 or a 1,3? Is it dextrorotatory, levorotatory? Very choosy molecules. 
And it's interesting because their major use in clinical medicine is to act as molecular probes. So it's interesting because you could actually read a paper, and I have on numerous occasions, when you go into the materials and methods section, it says the unknown carrier type was incubated uh, with uh, 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 lens culinaris agglutinin, and then we discovered its secondary structure by the utilization of peanut agglutinin, and then we basically followed that up with uh, uh, any number of different other lectins, uh, P lectin or whatever. So really what they're telling you is, we took this unknown thing, dropped a protein from peas on it, learned something, dropped a protein from lentils on it and learned something, dropped a protein from soybeans on it and learned something, because that's how we figure things out on that molecular level. We still do this, although nowadays we also use things like monoclonals and stuff, but these are still much better than most monoclonals because they actually will give you that tertiary three-dimensional shape in addition to whether the glycan is of one type or another. So where are these things? If we look at 2,000 foods as a work that was done, they found that roughly 1,000 foodstuffs contain one of these things. And then another study showed that if they looked at 88 foods that the guy sent his assistant out to the grocery store to buy, 36 had lectins that reacted with one blood group or another when they subjected to a different a series of reagent slides. And I mean, his methodology is beautiful. I sent, my, I sent my assistant out to the local grocery store. He bought a box of Kellogg's Special K. He bought a box of this and a box of that. And this is what they tested it on. But it turns out that this work actually is still seminal. But it gives you an idea that a large amount of what's going on in our guts on a molecular level with the very foods that we consume are capable of reacting with people in ways that are predictably different. And then you say to yourself, but wait a minute. What about all the times people eat stuff and they don't think twice about who they are and what it was they just ate? And the truth of the matter is, the body's a wonderful thing. The body actually heals. There are transaminases and all sorts of other enzymes that do nothing but cause repair from this damage. Okay? But when does the damage become beyond repair? It's typically when you have a chronic degenerative disease where the repair mechanism might not necessarily be able to keep up with the environmental insult level. That's when all of a sudden things change. And that's where, if you go back and look at the most common people who responded to the success of that book that David put up, it wasn't people trying to lose weight. Because when we collected the outcomes, yeah, there was some weight loss, but it was, I'm um, type O, and my Hashimoto's got better, okay? I'm um, type A, and my Crohn's disease improved. So in other words, the change that you could adapt and in, 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 in put into place by adapting these choices are not that significant in a fundamentally healthy person, but they change dramatically in the body of a sick person, like I detailed in that early slide, when we talked about how glycosylation differs. Age, infirmity. So again, it, this is not, and people want to always, when you look at the books, you see your publisher wants to be able to sell everything as weight loss. It's the way the business works, right? But these are diets that basically have much more effectiveness when it comes to being able to be used in people who have uh, pathology. That's the thing that makes them ring so true and make them so effective. And it's like, again, what did that Greek guy say? One man's food is someone else's poison. So anyway, we can make a simple list of foods that have lectins that you've probably consumed in this last year. And you probably did a good job. Your system probably handled the effect that they were having on your endothelial lining. It had a, a handled the effect that you were having on your mucosal membrane. It probably had the effect of modulating the endocytosis that they were stimulating because you're healthy. Okay? But when you make that change, when you have that chronic devitalizing degenerative disease, things change dramatically. I wish I could come back and tell you about the work that I'm doing where we are looking at the network aspects of, of infirmity and age because here's a fundamental thing that is interesting with, with the difference between, I hate to say it, us and them. The them 
have a paradigm that looks at chronic disease as an elongated version of acute disease. So again, a chronic disease to the standard dominant healthcare system is simply a stretched out version of an acute disease. Now, that's where the situation becomes quite bankrupt because what do you, what's the benefit of allopathic conventional care in acute disease? It's to remove a life-threatening thing largely by removing the life-threatening symptom. But when people have a chronic disease, it is not a elongated version of an acute disease. The system changes and adapts in every step of the way to the onslaught of the chronicity. A simple example is what's known as generative entrenchment, that the actual system adapts to its diminishing capabilities. It tries to the best of its abilities to adapt to this new reality. It's like, for instance, if you look at somebody like an elderly spinster, let's say, who was given an old mansion but then didn't have enough money to heat it, she would just wall off rooms, you know, to try to heat the small part of the house that she could afford. Well, that's how the body responds to chronic disease. It entrenches in suboptimal solutions. Okay, and then basically, if you address that, you can basically understand chronic disease from a completely different mechanism. But we look at it as a sort of a collection of symptoms, just like acute disease, the very ineffectual way, because chronic disease almost never benefits from symptom alleviation. Although sometimes you have to do it, of course. Again, I'll leave you to read all this wonderful stuff in your own. Uh, Endocytosis, we know. There's huge amounts of chemokine releases, we know. Interleukin-13, interleukin-4, these are typically things you'll see in mast cell activation, chronic food allergies. Lectins will be associated with dysbiosis, bacterial overgrowth. Matter of fact, most microorganisms have their role in life is to attach to you by them developing their own agglutinins in search of your glycans. And that's why we know certain infectious diseases are more prone in one blood type to another because certain microorganisms have a preference for a certain glycan that might be characteristic of this blood group, but not that blood group. And this, I mean, you can make a long list of micro, microbiomes that are blood type specific. Again, I'm going to just leave all this here for you. I pretty much addressed a lot of this already in terms of the effects. As you can see here, hormonal mimicry is also a big thing with regard to not only insulin, but you'll see effects, for instance, in steroids, um, uh, brain transmitters, increasing. Of course, gut permeability now is a big thing. It turns out that the gut is not so much permeable as it's full of a lot of bad players who want to suck stuff in. So it's, when we look at a hyperpermeable gut, we're not typically looking at a gut that's just like Swiss cheese. We're looking at a gut that's been deprogrammed and reprogrammed away from barrier defenses to absorption. Okay, that's a whole different mechanism than saying, okay, well, I shot a bunch of holes and everything's seeping in here. It turns out that a lot of that mechanism involved in endocytosis is actually, be, these are mechanisms that are part of your assimilation, and then they get derailed. Again, I wish this thing wasn't doing this whole... What I wanted to do? I wanted to give this lecture for me is what I wanted to do. I got the award. You know, I want to get out of here. It's, it's, it's so big they can't get it in the door. Uh, so anyway, looking at lectins, here's another thing. When you look at plants that are anti-metastatic, anti-cancer, a lot of them are because they contain certain types of lectins. Viscum album, right? Phytolacca, if you herbalists. Many of the plants that we use in traditional herbal medicine have their efficacy because the plants contain known agglutinants with a predilection for certain types of microorganism or certain types of deranged tissue types. I got to give you a few things to take home and try next Monday. 
If you have people who have come back and said they've done a colonoscopy and I've got polyps, tell them to eat a lot of mushrooms. But don't tell them to eat the expensive mushrooms. Tell them to eat the cheap stuff in the supermarket, the so-called silver dollar mushroom, Agaricus bisporus, okay? The one that nobody wants to eat anymore, okay? Agaricus bisporus lectin and Vicia fava lectin, which is also the lectin in, 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 uh, in fava beans, uh, contain, contain an agglutinin that reprograms the changes on the neoplastic cell surface and by manipulating the glycans on the surface sends a message through receptor tyrosine kinase back to the nucleus and says, you all made a mistake here in your genome and you should go fix it. So there's studies that show that just adopting this particular mechanism, taking people with precancerous colons, uh, colons and neoplasia and, and polyps and just giving them these two foods you will see that when they get their next colonoscopy, the gastroenterologists say, man, things are looking pretty good here because we've actually pushed all the buttons that made the mechanism go backwards in time. M mushrooms, by the way, have been known to stimulate insulin release in type 1 diabetics, people who don't have the propensity because they don't have the Isla Longahan cells. It still manages to stimulate insulin release. Mushrooms get a bad rap in natural medicine. This guy's name is Gerhard Uhlenbrook. He's one of the most profound lectin scientists, University of Cologne. He discovered what is known as the Thomson-Friedenreich or the T and T antigen, which later became in its form the CA15-3 tumor marker. So his work resulted in the characterization of the CA15-3, the CA2729, and some aspects of the CA1919 tumor markers, all the result of his work in lectins. And he will tell the story that the reason he worked in lectins was because in post-war Germany, they could get lectins because they could work with these things they were super cheap to get. And he discovered the structure of Thomson-Friedenreich antigen using a lectin from peanut, peanut agglutinin. Thomson-Friedenreich antigen is one of the few pan-carcinoma antigens. If you look at any cancer system, it will manifest some degree of T antigen expression. And when you look at breast cancer, it's a classic example of T antigen expression because most of the breast cancer tumor markers are indirectly associated with T antigen expression. They become corrupted versions of T, which T becomes a corrupted version, believe it or not, of blood group A. So when looking at this, this guy did all this great work I was in touch with him for many years, brilliant man. And then I started paying attention to this particular lectin that you find in snails, escargot, right? It has a lectin called helix palmatia glutenin, HPA. Like most tumor markers tend to overexpress a chemical called GALMAC, and acetylgalactosamine. Okay, which turns out to be the actual antigenic structure most commonly associated with the blood group A antigen, which might explain why over the last 40 years, most studies have shown an increase in cancer in that blood type over the others. Okay, you don't like attacking things that are kind of trying to look like you, obviously. Well, it turns out that this particular lectin targets a chemical called ligand-like complex, <clears throat> which is an escape and evasion marker that breast cancer cells use to escape out of the lymph node. They're egress molecules. And that basic egress molecule allows the cancer cell to get out of the lymph node, get into the systemic circulation. And they, people, it was done by a woman named Susan Brooks in England that looked at the ability of this lectin to interact directly with this ligand-like marker. In and of itself, interesting. Who's ever died from a snail? You know, escargot's not too bad if you put enough butter and garlic on it. Um, and in the end, you wind up in a situation where it's just applied food chemistry going directly to where it needs to go based upon a better intellectual understanding of the nexus of the problem, right? I found a 15th century Italian manuscript that said, if a woman has a cancer of the mammary, tell her to go out and eat snails. So talk about wisdom.
You can do a similar thing using two herbs, one called wild indigo and another one known as whorehound, which they put in cough drops. We'll target those same markers. And again, I won't go through this, but it turns out that there was a guy named George Springer who treated breast cancer by giving women a version of the typhoid antibody in addition to some other magical vaccine that he made out of blood group substances and had tremendous results until unfortunately he passed away in the middle of his own studies. The guy was a major force in blood group research. Typhoid vaccine was being used to treat women with active breast cancer. If you look at this description here of Baptisia, it comes out of William Burke's Pocket Materia Medica from 1911, that this very plant increases a person's production of antibodies against typhoid. And it contains a lectin that's known to, mark, uh, to actually attack and directly these markers themselves. Ullenbrook actually sent me this card when he read my book. David showed the other picture of my dad. My dad taught me that you could be creative. You know, there was no reason to not think creatively about anything. You can put your thoughts and possibilities together on anything. And the thing that basically is most convincing about blood groups is why people would pay attention to them anyway, because we're so heavily programmed to think of them as nothing other than a complication of transfusion. We tend to think of blood groups as a complication of transfusion. Think of the paucity of creativity behind that statement. We think of blood types as a complication of transfusion. That's how they're taught in medical school. Nobody turns around and says, nature did not put blood group antigens in a person to screw up a transfusion in an emergency room. Okay? There has to be an etiological, there needs to be a teleological reason why these things are there. Okay? Well, they are there for a couple of really good reasons. One of them is they make different populations susceptible to different types of pandemics, as David alluded that there's differences in outcomes in a variety of different pandemic diseases. So nature likes the idea that you can have a variety of phenotypic differences that might offset a single pandemic going through a population exclusively and tearing that population apart. There's always going to be a pivot point that's going to be a bit more resistant than the others. And you could look at all the major killers in the history of humankind they all have a preference for one, one, one ABO blood type that's more likely and more susceptible, and one ABO blood type that's more resistant. As I said before, a lot of blood group manifestation is in malignancy, mainly because a lot of the control of the exterior of the cell is corrupted in the malignant process and is an important process in detachment, malignant spread, all the other things that we don't really want to have to experience if we get sick with cancer. But there are other things, too. Blood group O has been known to have uh, ulcers. I did a thing on CVS this morning one time, and I was... <laughs> turned out that the producer was a patient of mine and called me up the day before and says, I just want you to let you know the science director is going to tear into your book and uh, you should be ready for it. And I went and did the interview, and he was the nicest guy, totally supportive and everything. So I asked the producer after the thing, I said, what happened to him? Well, she said, oh, his wife's a gastroenterologist, and they were eating breakfast, and he said, we're going to be talking to this guy who wrote this ridiculous book that your blood type in might influence your diet, and he's saying things that blood type O gets more ulcers than the other blood types. And the wife looked up at him and said, we've known that since the 1950s. So again, one of the things about what we actually are trying to do is offset a certain level of pre-programming. If you go to PubMed and put in blood group, ABO blood groups, you could get about 24,000 electronic citations, of which about 4,000 have nothing to do with transfusions. 
Okay, they have to do with all sorts of interesting things. I wish I had time to tell you about stress mediators that are linked to blood group. But let me give you the second secret reason why there are blood groups, in my estimation. If you were to look at chromosome 9, band 3, 34, Q34, so 9, Q34, chromosome 9, Q band, band 34. That's where your ABO blood type is. If you look at a picture, that one of those pictures where it looks like the worm with stripes, okay, the stripe where ABO is, is big and thick and black, okay, which means that there's a huge amount of chromatin at that locus. Now, why would there be a huge amount of chromatin at that locus if the only thing you're coding for is three enzymes? Well, it turns out that there's a phenomenon known as genetic linkage, and there are an inordinate number of physiological traits that have been shown to be linked to that particular locus. So, for instance, we know that people who are type O have problems modulating dopamine because they have a compromised mechanism with dopamine beta hydroxylase. We know that people who are type A have problems modulating cortisol. We know that type B are more effective at modulating nitric oxide, all because of these interlinked genetic linkages that have nothing to do with the physical expression of their blood type. Nature just thought this was a convenient place to program a few extra other variations. May, if this happens, then that happens. But if this happens, that happens. And probably all part of a whole survival mechanism. There's a nice slide of blood. And that's what happens when you put a lectin on it. It just gets all clumped up. Lectins are Velcro in the balls of your life. You know, if you look at a tennis ball, beat it up a little, get it nice and hairy, and put a few of them in a shoebox. Cut up some double-sided Velcro, throw it in there, shake the, ball, the box up, you're going to hear thump, 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 and then eventually you're just going to hear thump, 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 because they all cross-linked, and instead of a whole bunch of balls banging around that box, you just got one big clump of tennis balls. Well, when you have a normal cell, it looks like a baseball. You ever look at a baseball? All nice stitching. That's because the glycans are all tightly controlled because the genes are working very good. But when you have a cancer cell, it looks like a tennis ball because the genetic control over glycosylation is out of control. So now you've got all this fuzz all over the place. And that essentially is why things like lectins show such promise in ma managing types of things like malignancies. Like you would see, like we talked about our pre-malignant state with um, mushrooms and wild indigo and whorehound. I mean, this is food as medicine, isn't it? These are some of the most ubiquitous things you can think of. But the interesting thing, of course, is how we have these opposing antibodies. So if you said to yourself, OK, why? I can understand why we have different antibodies, because we have different antigens that will make us less susceptible to certain bacteria. Why do, we, why do we hate the other people so much? Why do we hate the other blood types so much? Well, it's because. When we declare to the environment, this is us, we make a, a corollary that says, that's not us. OK? And we don't like that. And most of those antibodies are directed towards microbes and viruses and all sorts of things. You don't make those antibodies to screw up transfusions, obviously. Well, that's what's taught to people. I'm almost out of time. I want to go through one of the things I think is so cool. ABO is one weird gene, OK? For two reasons. You all know SNPs, right? You get an A over here and a G over there. This is the minor allele. This is the major allele. This is the risk allele for this condition. Straightforward. Either this letter or that letter. Allelic dominance, right? ABO is the only place where you have alleles occasionally show up that are codominant, right? When you're blood type AB, you wind up with an A allele and a B allele, 
and they don't even control each other. They just exist. So number one, you don't normally see alleles that are codominant. You usually see one dominant over the other. But here's even more important. What makes a person blood type O is called a frame shift mutation. Not only is it not a situation where you have a SNP outcome that determines a phenotypic trait, the entire SNP is missing and the entire genome moves over one. This is normally a lethal mutation in any other circumstance, except when it happens here and it gives you blood type O. Okay? But when you have frame shift mutations anywhere else, usually it's not compatible with living. You don't like to have everything move over one. It just doesn't work. But it does here. So these are really interesting mutations. Again, I'll just go, I went over that. Baba B. Here's the other thing, too. And this plays into uh, COVID. If you're type A, you got viscosity issues, especially if you get mad. Because anger and all these other things in type A causes a major influx in factor eight, von Wildebrand factor, and blood viscosity. So when you look at things like uh, diabetes, uh, cancer, they're all associated with type A because it's associated. This is the one thing that a hematologist knows about blood type that doesn't have to do transfusions. You know what that is? That in type A individuals, you have to pay attention to the fact that their factor VIII levels are 30% higher in normal people. Okay? So if you're type A, you're walking around with a clotting factor that runs about 30% higher, even if you're just completely normal. Now, the other thing here is look at COVID and look at what the consequences were of COVID infection, right? Massive amount of microclotting and things. And what was the predilection in COVID? It was type A over type O. I think I said all that. So if you look at uh, viscosity, cardiovascular issues, here's an interesting thing. If you go to PubMed and look at ABO and heart disease, coronary artery disease, myocardial infarction, peripheral artery disease, ischemic heart disease, claudication, you will see uniformly always in excess of type A. Always in excess of type A. There was one study where they looked at a population and didn't see that. And was an elderly population. When they went back, they realized all the A's were already dead. So, you know, what does this mean? Well, we can, we can benefit from this insight because what are the things that are most likely to result in a benefit of a person who's got clotting tendencies? A kind of a nice Mediterranean-type diet, right? Endothelially protective diet. Now, if you're type O, on the other hand, you have this amazing enzyme called intestinal alkaline phosphatase, which runs almost threefold higher in you than the other blood types. Intestinal alkaline phosphatase does two things. For about four weeks of your life as a fetus, it's the single biggest enzyme in your body because it's making your digestive tract happen. Okay, it's, it's making the lining of your digestive tract. We pay attention to phosphatases typically with regard to heart disease. But you can actually test. Uh, my friend Todd Lapine does tests for alkaline phosphatase. He does alkaline phosphatase isoenzymes. One of the things that you learn about intestinal alkaline phosphatase is three times higher in type O. But what does it do? It breaks down cholesterol, increases absorption of calcium, causes all sorts of changes to the lipid particle structure, and it's induced in type O in higher amounts by a high-protein meal. So it turns out that if you look at type O, you would see somebody who's expressly suited for a slightly higher or more protein-dense diet because they contain a lot of the mechanistic aspects that would best deal with that. And indeed, their calcium absorption will not be good unless they're given a protein meal to stimulate the intestinal alkaline phosphatase that's responsible for absorbing their calcium. This was not what was taught to dietitians for 40 years. Dietitians were taught 
that you take a person off high protein because it leaches calcium from the bone, the idea being that protein made the body more acidic, and the acidity caused the body to take calcium to buffer the acidity, so high protein caused bone loss. Never proven, widely taught. Now, coming later on, people started thinking, now wait a minute, what are there mechanisms inside of a person that stimulates compensatory mechanisms that don't result in the calcium being gotten out of the bone, but rather gotten by increasing the absorptive capability through the diet? And you're looking at this right here. So, want to see some good things with regard to type O? You, this is your basic caveman diet. Really, it's ideally suited to your basic paleo type diet. I'm not going to go through the blood type diet. I just wanted to make those two examples. And you think about it, it is. Somebody goes, well, it's too simple. It is very simple. You know, you just got a genetic marker that goes four ways. You go this way, you go that way. It's not a big deal, but it is a characterization. It's a signpost along the way that you can work with and embellish with your other facts, your other discoveries. You can build upon it. Bugs have blood types. You have blood types, believe it or not. Bacteria eat right for their type. Certain bacteria will be inside of you because they like you as a substrate. They like your blood type as a substrate. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time here. I'm already out of time already. You familiar with secretor status? FUT2, my, single, my second most favored gene. Fucosylase 2. Fucosyl transferase 2. What does it do? Amongst other things, it, it causes you to express more of your blood type in a free form. So people who lack the active form of this gene only secrete their blood type in bound form. It's only bound to their tissues. But if you're 80% of the population, you have the active form of this gene, and you secrete your blood type in a free form. So you could be blood type from saliva. You could be blood type from vaginal stain. You could be blood type from a semen stain or sweat. Your blood type is in your secretions. And it turns out that this is a major marker, not only of the expression of ABO, but the expression of all things glycans. And for a simple reason. 20% of the people in this room, if there is an outbreak of norovirus in this room, will not get norovirus. Because they are 20% that have the knockout. They have the null form of this gene. They are non-secretors. And it's been proven that the non-secretor status is associated with resistance to norovirus. 80% of the people in this room, if exposed to norovirus, would get norovirus because they are secretors. If you take these two genes, you can sort of get a logarithmic approach to the degree of ABO and glycan expression. But the interesting thing, too, is you know what a power law is? It's, it comes from an Italian guy who figured out, he tried to understand why 20% of the people owned 80% of the real estate in Italy. But then they started looking at this in businesses, and they, they wanted to figure out why in a business 20% of the employees did 80% of the work. And this 80-20 rule applies to many, many things. And the thing that is most interesting about it is that it's scalable. Another story, another lecture. But the interesting thing about non-secretor status is that they are 20% of the population, but they will be 80% of your complex immunological uh, environmental patients, 80-20. 20% of the population, 80% of the people you wish there was a back door to your practice so that you could leave because they're going to drive you crazy with complex illnesses. Okay? So learn. You can do this. There's one SNP in 23andMe that you only need to know the outcome of this one SNP and you can calculate non-secretor status. Okay? And it's easy enough. You could look it up on PubMed. And here you've got this beautiful piece of insight into glycosylation as well. Again, I talked about COVID. I should talk to you about fucose. Right now, if I've done my job, you guys, are, your brains are fucosylating. Okay? Why? Because when you make associative neurons, they attach to the main axon through a process of fucosylation which is why you should always breastfeed your kids. Because human milk is the highest containing fucose milk of any mammalian species. Second place isn't even close. 
So breastfeeding kids guaranteed more fucose, more fucose guaranteed more associative neurons, more associative neurons, more complex learning, straightforward glycan type thing. I love fucose. It's an amazing gene. You know what's a good place to get fucose? Bladder rack. Okay? The classic uh, type of seaweed thingy. Okay? If they call it fucus because it's got fucose. Now here's an interesting thing. Everybody talks about biofilms, right? You know the one thing you can't grow a biofilm on? Fucose. <laughs> because it figured out, thanks to Charles Darwin, that at the interface of water and land is a bad place. So I better develop a way to not get myself one of those bad biofilms. So you can't grow, you see vegetables don't grow biofilms. Part of the reason, guess what? Canada albicans. You know what Canada albicans doesn't like? Fucose because it bonds to their adhesins and makes it very difficult for them to actually attach. And again, we know this from blood groups as well. Again, secretive stuff. I did this. There's all the things I should have mentioned. Here's some things you can take with you on Monday morning. Again, here's immunological consequences. And finally, I get to the last slide. Uh, what you can do here is go to this link and download a PDF of a chapter of a textbook I wrote. And it's all on the, it's much more dense than the books that I've written. It's molecular biology stuff, but it's very, very fun, deep, and it is just a very, very good read. And you get that chapter, comes out of that textbook, you can download it. You know, put it wherever you like to read stuff that's going to take you a while. The uh, interesting thing, too, is if you want to be on top of what's going on in glycomics and you have a Twitter account, use the hashtag glycotime. If you put the hashtag glycotime in Twitter, you will be constantly seeing all the wonderful stuff that's happening with the research community in glycomics. It's a beautiful way of being able to keep on top of the literature. And it is exploding. It is exploding. I wish I could tell you about how glycomics and your endothelial reticulum and your Golgi apparatus modulate the inflammatory process. It's the simple reason everybody takes steroids is to try and stop that. But you can do things with foods and, and, and natural products that do that same thing. And guess what? At the end of it all, the steroid didn't fix the, on the endoplasmic reticulum stress, it just blunted the reaction to it. But if the right choice in foods and things, you can re-manipulate those things and drop the level of endoplasmic reticulum stress down, which is, underlies almost all inflammatory processes. So anyway, thank you. Uh, it was wonderful being here. I love the award. Thank you so much. <laughs>